Well, it's time to get going here. Uh, we should get started. Welcome, everybody. Again, welcome to those who are watching from home. Uh, let me pray, and then Melissa will tell us about our game for this evening. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for Five for Faith. I want to thank you what we've been learning, and just thank you that we can come together as a church family. Just pray, Heavenly Father, this evening that you'd bless our time, and that you would, uh, again, we just ask that we'd learn, and also, Lord, just that you'd bless our fun and our fellowship together as well. We're thankful for the food that we've been able to enjoy as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just for those of you that don't know, my name is Melissa, and this is my husband, Andrew. We're going to play a little game tonight. We've kind of been doing a little game to start each week. So what you're going to do this week is if you're, you are going to stand up if you believe that the statement that we read is true. So each statement is either true or false. You have to make the stand and say, yes, this is true by standing up. And tonight's game theme is all about the pastors. So we interviewed them, and the statements are whether or not these things I say or we say about the pastors are true. <clears throat> okay, I will go first. The sound of somebody typing on a keyboard drives me crazy. So you need to stand up if you believe that that statement is true. <laughs> It is true. It drives me bonkers. I wish it didn't. Anyway. So if you get to five, if you stand up five, oh no, if you get five, if you get five right, you can come on up and grab one of our candies up at the front here. Awesome. Okay, number two. Pastor Dave has a secret talent of playing the harmonica. Stand up if you believe that to be true. <laughs> Pastor Dave has a secret talent of playing the harmonica. It is false. Well. <laughs> Sorry. His secret talent is play me accordion. So <laughs> we had hoped maybe he could show us tonight for a talent show. Maybe but next week. Maybe we'll next week. Accordion. Okay. Pastor Tyler's favorite place to vacation is Sugar Lake. And obviously Tyler cannot either stand or sit for this answer. So or don't his follow wife. his lead. So Pastor Tyler's favorite place to vacation, Sugar Lake. That is true. Okay, question number four. Pastor Don enjoys vacations in the Northern Hemisphere or anywhere that it is cold. Oh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Maybe someone doesn't know. No brave soul would like to stand? <laughs> no. It is false, so congratulations, you got a point on that one. Okay, Pastor Andrew's favorite cereal is chocolate frosted flakes, true or false? Chocolate frosted flakes is my favorite cereal. Ben is still deciding whether he knows what this yeah. answer. <laughs> ben looks very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say true for that one. <laughs> <laughs> On the same theme as porridge, Oh, sorry. On the same theme as breakfast, Pastor Dave's favorite cereal is porridge. True so or we've false? gone to chocolate frosted flakes to porridge. Maybe when I get the day of the age, porridge will be my favorite too. It I'm is true. <laughs> <laughs> You're still in chocolate frosted That's flakes. That's right. I haven't matured. I'm very immature. Okay, Pastor Tyler's favorite movie is Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, true or false? Oh, yeah. Come on, grab a candy if you've yeah, got five. You've Good got job, Nathaniel. Five. Yep. So that would be false. It's actually Pastor Don's favorite movie. Okay, next question. Pastor Don has a secret talent of cooking. Raise your hand, oh no, stand up if you believe that to be true. There's a few people brave to stand. Yes, Brooklyn, stand up there because Brooklyn, you are right. Pastor Don has a secret talent of being able to cook. Porridge. Yeah, porridge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, no, you can go. Yep. The next place that Pastor Andrew would like to visit or have a trip to is California. So you stand up if you believe that to be true. It's true. Never been there. I want to go. It doesn't really fit our family, but I'd like to rent a convertible and drive the twisty roads by the ocean. All six of us don't fit in the convertible. So, I guess it's you and I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, Pastor Dave's favorite restaurant is the dining room on a cruise ship. And that is true. Remember, if you get the five, come up and grab a chocolate. Okay, we'll just do two more, 14 and 15. Sure. Pastor Dave's favorite movie is The Princess Bride. Stand up if you believe that to be true. You are correct, it is true, along with, which is interesting, both Tyler and Pastor Dave believe have their favorite movie as Princess Bride. It's a good one. Okay. Last question. Pastor Don's favorite local restaurant is Wasabi, true or false? No, no, stand up if it's true. Yeah, that's true, stand up if it's true, I guess. It is true. I was given away by most of his family that stood up almost <laughs> <Yeah>. immediately. <laughs> So the family that we are going to interview tonight as our new family were, uh, unfortunately, they were got sick last night. So we're going to jump right to Pastor D um, Don. Don. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He's... I could not believe the number of times that has happened in the last few months. Uh, there's no way to safely put on one of those mics and not get it stuck around that strap. Uh, we are in April, actually I guess more like spring of 1523 in the middle of Martin Luther's story. So if you're just joining us, you've kind of missed a couple of the chapters, but tonight we want to talk about Martin Luther's family. And the reason I want to talk about it tonight is because in that spring of 1523, a letter arrived addressed to Martin Luther from a group of 12 nuns who were at the convent in Nimishin. So if we get the next couple pictures, I'm gonna show you first the, the gal we're gonna talk quite a bit about, uh, Catherine von Bora. And then the next place is the remnants of the uh, convent where these 12 nuns lived. These nuns had read a book that Martin Luther had written called On Monastic Vows, where he declared for all the world to know that he did not think it was good to have nuns or monks anymore. And when these nuns read it, 12 of them decided, you know what, we're convinced. Instead of being in a monastery or a, a convent, we want to be able to be free and to be able to have families and to get married and all these kind of things. The only problem was to help a nun escape from a convent was a capital offense, which means if they caught you, they would kill you. Uh, now, I don't know if they knew that uh, Martin Luther was already under a death sentence because of his heresies. Maybe that's why they picked him. But they wrote him a letter asking him to free these nuns. One of them was this gal named Catherine who was born in January of 1499. And when she was six, her mother had died. And so she was put into a Catholic school. When she turned nine, she was sent from the school to a convent. And by the time she was 16, she was a fully pledged nun. She had never really been outside of the convent in her basically her entire adult life. Uh, but she wanted to be free, and she was one of the 12. So Martin Luther came up with a plan, along with a fellow by the name of uh, Leonard Cope, who was a, a fish merchant. And this is where it gets pretty interesting, because this almost starts to sound like some sort of weird, like Hobbit slash Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of thing. Uh, but Leonard delivered pickled herring in large barrels. And so um, on this particular night, it was the day before Easter, uh, Leonard brought his wagon with these 12 barrels. They emptied out the fish and put a nun into each barrel and whisked them to safety. Martin Luther then helped three of them go home because they were quite young and their families walking to the back home. And then that left nine. Of the nine, eight of them were, were essentially married or... Um, or became, uh, I think three of them became governesses in homes. It left one, Catherine, who was engaged to be married with apparently a man who loved her and she loved him, but then he just disappeared. And I wish I could tell you why or where he went, but all historians know is that he was there and then he was gone. And so she had no one to marry, and she made a comment one day that she would be willing to marry Martin Luther which, if you know much about him, he had some rather peculiar habits. I mean, obviously, he was a very strong-willed man, a very brilliant man, but some very peculiar things. We'll get to a couple of them in a couple minutes. But Martin Luther had decided he never wanted to get married. After all, what was the point when he was living day-to-day -day thinking he would be put to death? And so to get married just made no sense to him. And besides, he said he found uh, Catherine to be very, very proud. 
She was also very strong-willed, apparently. But uh, eventually, at the age of 42, because his father took him aside and said, Martin, I think it'd be good for you to get married, he decided to go ahead and marry this woman, who he said he felt neither passion, love, nor burning for her. Not a very romantic guy. In fact, he gave four reasons why he would marry her. One, it would please his father. Two, it would rile the Pope. Three, it would cause the angels to laugh. And four, it would spite the devil. So you can imagine how romantic this was. I am going to marry you, honey, because this will spite the devil and upset the Pope. But he did marry her on June 13, 1525. Uh, even though many of his good friends were so against it, they refused to actually go to the wedding. But he married Catherine. She was a feisty redhead. She was in her 20s at this point. Very, very brilliant woman. Uh, very, very strong-willed. And the two of them made an interesting combination. In fact, Luther had lots to say about her that I would encourage you, if you ever get to a hold of any of his books, it's worth reading just even the part about his marriage relationship. Uh, because he went from a man who said, I felt no love or no passion for this woman. By the end of his life, the things he would say about her, he was absolutely devoted. She won him over like nothing you would believe. Um, she uh, was a, let's see, what was she? She was a massage therapist, a brewmaster, and a herbalist. And when she came into Luther's house, she basically took over the home. Uh, as I said, Luther had some unusual habits. One of them was the fact that he had not changed his bed for over a year, and apparently it smelled rather foul. The other is he was not eating very well, and he was known to have extremely bad gas. I kid you not. And so she tried to put him on a proper diet to try to cure some of his issues. Um, he had a number of names he would call her. He would call her his his sweetheart Kate, his dearly beloved Kate, his true love, Mrs. Doctor, and the one that I find kind of interesting, my lady of the pig market, because she became a very industrious farmer. In fact, by the time she and Luther passed away, they were probably the wealthiest family at Wittenberg because of her efforts as she had a, a uh, where's the list, a thriving number of businesses, including a fish farm and a, a fairly major agricultural enterprise. Um, as I said, I really encourage you to get your hands on some of this stuff. Luther was known to be terrible with money. In fact, he said, God made fingers with space between so the money had somewhere to go. Uh, and so she took over all of their finances and managed it brilliantly. Uh, he once wrote a letter to someone, I'm sending you a vase as a wedding present. P.S. Katie has hidden it. In other words, she wouldn't let him get his hands on it because she knew he would lose it or give it away or do something. They, uh, they took over, I think we've got a picture of the house here coming up. They took over what's called the Black Cloister. There it is. This became their house. Uh, one of the local uh, Catholic leaders gave it. It didn't look quite like this. In fact, it was quite run down. She renovated the whole thing. By the time they were done, they would typically have 100 people to dinner to sit down for a meal. Uh, at any given time, she would have about 30 boarders in addition to their own family. And speaking of family, they would eventually have six kids of their own. Hans, the firstborn, Elizabeth, the second, who was... Um, sadly would die at about uh, nine months old. Uh, Magdalene, Martin, Paul, and Margaret. Uh, Magdalene also died when she was 13 years old, and she died in Martin Luther's arms as they had a most brilliant conversation about heaven and what it was all involved in. Now, having kids for a priest and a nun was a very interesting thing because it was said that the child of a priest and a nun would be a two-headed monster, most likely the Antichrist. And so when they decided to have a family, a lot of people were watching with great anticipation of what was going to happen. But uh, the kids turned out well. Hans became a lawyer named after Luther's father. Remember, Luther was going to be a lawyer, so Hans became a lawyer. Martin Jr. studied theology. Paul became a doctor. Uh, Marguerite married a Prussian a nobleman. That was sort of their, their family life. Um, for, for entertainment, they bowled in their garden, played chess, and uh, did a lot of music. They also had a pet dog. I do not know what kind. I wish I did. But the one, one lasting legacy of of Catherine, and we can flip to the next picture, I think we'll see some inside pictures of their house, was what happened in this room. This is, uh, if you've heard of anything uh, that Martin Luther wrote, you know that one of the most famous, probably the most famous book that's in existence called Table Talk. We have a copy in the library if you're interested. And after dinner, Martin Luther would meet with his guests and they would talk about theology, the Lord, and his guests started to write down the things he would say. And uh, Catherine was always involved at this. So if you can see in the next picture, that is her sewing desk, and that is his table. And they would sit, and there they would discuss theology and all these kind of things at a time when women were not typically involved in that kind of thing. And so by the end of his life, dear Kate had contributed in massive ways to his life, and he left all of his possessions, everything to her, which again was absolutely 
foreign at this day. In fact, it was so foreign that after his death, a judge ruled that his will was invalid. It couldn't be done. Uh, Catherine died on December 20th, 1552, at the age of 53. She was escaping a war in Wittenberg with her children. We'll get to Luther's death next week. He had already died at this point. And in the middle of a storm, she was trying to guide her cart to keep it on the road. The cart went off into a ditch. She was injured, was was wet in the ditch, got very cold, and did not survive um, that sort of time. And so she was uh, unfortunately uh, taken very ill and died and was buried in a place called Turgu. And I think we have one last thing. It is the only, the only image of Luther and his kids. It's a cast of Luther, Katrina, and two of the children. There we go. And next week, we'll find out how Luther's story ends. Tonight, our sola is Christ alone, uh, the object of our faith. Now, we've been looking at salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And last week, we considered how faith is the means by which the grace of God is appropriated. But it's important to remind ourselves to understand that faith itself is not what saves us, but rather it's the object of our faith that saves us. Faith is the means, not the justifier. You can have mountains of faith in something which has no power to save you, and you are no better off than the person who has no faith at all. The question isn't simply, do you have faith? But in what or in whom do you have faith? Now, the testimony of Scripture is that there is only one who can save, and that is Jesus Christ, Christ alone. <clears throat> so let's just take a quick minute to reflect on what Scripture has to say about him. So starting back in Genesis 22 with the promise... In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The prophet Isaiah, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. John the Baptist testified. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> God the Father himself at Jesus' baptism. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And at the transfiguration, a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Jesus himself testified, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then we have the apostles. <clears throat> whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter says, Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And in 1 John we read, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. <clears throat> now, faith in Christ, it's not a religious system or a philosophy where somehow man tries to better himself, tries to appease God, tries to justify himself. The defining principle of Christianity is this, that God has descended into his own creation and has in himself appeased his own wrath, and justified the objects of his affection. Now, why is this so? <clears throat> because man is bound in sin. His affections are irreversibly corrupted. We have no inclination in and of ourselves towards God. We have no means in ourselves with which to atone for our transgressions. And we have no power in ourselves to begin living righteously. So we are hopelessly enslaved to sin. We are slaves to its guilt, to its power, and its effect. So we need an alien righteousness, one that is outside ourselves. We need someone else to atone for us and to deliver us. Only Christ's sacrifice is sufficient to satisfy the wrath of God. And only Christ's righteousness is perfect and able to justify us in the presence of God. 
There is no other provision for sin. Now, just a little point of caution. Sometimes when we speak of salvation by grace through faith in Christ, there's a little bit of confusion relating to the distinction between merit and effect. <clears throat> to the issue of merit, we cannot add anything to Christ's righteousness. We cannot add anything to his sacrifice. It is not Christ plus anything. It is Christ alone. The merit is his. There is nothing to be added to warrant salvation, and to try to do so is to, to declare that Christ is insufficient. But there's also the issue of effect. Faith works. It produces. Christ works. The object of our faith is not a dead idol or a philosophy, but it's God himself who is at work within us. Faith bears fruit. The one to whom God grants faith will not only be saved from the penalty of sin, but also delivered from the bondage of sin. They'll be changed. It's not a matter of good works in order to be saved, but a matter of good works because we have been saved. We have been given a new heart, which is inclined towards God. We've been given the Holy Spirit who instructs us, convicts us, and empowers us. The redeemed person literally becomes a new creation. The same Lord who died to save us is at work within us. This is summed up in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work to his good pleasure. Speaking to the effect of faith, Jesus said in John 15, 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And to merit, Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Hello, everybody. I understand there's, um, if you can put our logo on the screen, there we go. I understand there's some confusion about the Ephesians reference up there being different than what we're learning. Um, so our logo actually for Sword Keepers Group has that reference because that's um, the source of the name of Sword Keepers is the armor of God and the sword of the spirit. So we're Sword Keepers and yeah, so sorry for the conf confusion. Uh, just to keep you on your toes. Uh, so if everybody can stand up, we'll work on our scripture memory. Ready? Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called. So do that with me, just as you were called. So this calling is again that same calling from earlier in the, in the verses, it's an invitation. So that calling is an invitation to salvation through Christ. So just as you were called to the one hope, so we're doing this for hope, because it's an expectation of what is sure. So we can't touch or see it now, but that calling, the salvation through Christ, we have firm hope in that. So we're doing this, to the one hope that belongs to your call. So just as you were called, to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, so we're doing a crown, open hands. So Lord means absolute master, owner. Um, so we're doing a crown for king because he's king of our hearts. He's absolute owner of our hearts and our lives. So one Lord. So just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith. So faith is a gift from God. It's not something we produce in ourselves. It's a gift from God. So we're holding out our hands like we're accepting the gift of faith. So one faith so we'll do from Lord, one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism. So just a reminder, this whole section is about unity. So we are united in these things. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, let's do from there is one body. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're gonna go right from the very top. Ephesians 4, verses one through six. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Good job. So for those who don't know, when we do Sword Keepers, I do video tutorials that are kind of like what I've been doing here, and the kids watch the tutorials online. They can watch as often as they want until they learn the whole passage. Then we get together and rehearse in person, and then they recite it on stage. So I wanna let you all know, I would love to do Sword Keepers with a group of teenagers or with seniors. Those are a couple of my little dreams, or with a mixed group of all ages. So um, yeah, if you're interested, uh, email address for Sword Keepers, you can reach me at just swordkeepers at gmail.com, and there's little handouts on the kids' booth out there. And I'm gonna go like 30 seconds over, we're gonna do this one more time. With smiles, and I want you to think about what you're saying as well. Think about the actions and what the words mean as you're going through it. Ready? Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Good job. Snapshots from Bible School, where, I mean, you probably already all know what it's about at this point. So we just take in uh, one of our Miller students and ask them one thing that they've learned this year. So right now I'm going to call up Riley Dreyer. He is a third year, wow, ovation. He is a third year at Miller College of the Bible, and I'm going to hand off the mic to him as he is going to tell you one thing he learned this year. I told him I was going to wing this whole thing, and he started sweating and, like, getting mad at me. So we're good. I wrote it down. Um, so when I think back on my last three years at Miller, there are many, many things that I have learned. I mean, it's kind of what you expect when you go and pursue the Lord and study his scriptures for three years and spend a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. I could talk about how he has helped me with pride by humiliating me, how he's been working on my insecurities, how he's taught me to trust him with my future plans. How I've learned the beauty of community and fellowship and how I've learned that God will hold me fast through it all. Um, there are about a million things that I've learned in my time at Miller, but one of the most important things I've learned that will go with me through life is that suffering and difficult situations are often things that God uses to teach us and help us grow. My first three years at Miller have not been easy by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, while one of those are some of my favorite years, um, they are also some of the hardest years of my life. It has felt like God has been teaching me by pushing me to the ground and then picking me up, brushing me off, and then pushing me right back into the ground to teach me something new because I'm daft and that's the only way I will learn. In my first year, my dorm had a not so nice visit and infestation by bed bugs 
and we were all forced to live out of garbage bags as they tried to fix this, and then every time we did laundry, leave our laundry in the garbage bags so it would cook the bugs, and it was terrible. <laughs> and then I had a mental health, like, struggle, and my roommates had an intervention for me because they were so worried where they bought me ice cream, so that was sweet. Uh, and then as soon as the bed bugs were gone, uh, we got kicked out of school because of COVID, and we never got to take our stuff out of our garbage bags. So that was unfortunate. In my second year, my friend and my classmate, Kyle Nash, had an accident while snowboarding um, over Christmas break, and he passed away. And the whole student body was left to mourn for the second semester. This year has also had a lot of ups and downs. We've already had two COVID outbreaks, isolations, and disunity because of how that had to be handled. And so while all of this has been hard, and the student body as a whole and my class have had lots of difficulties, uh, and that doesn't include all the personal things that I've gone through, like arguments and friendships, uh, losing people to going to Winnipeg and I'd lose my best friends, or tough conversations and leadership. Uh, but God, through it all, has been teaching me to rely and trust on him. He has taught me about his character and his provision through all of these circumstances. He has taught me skills that will help me lead a family in the future and run ministries in the future. And through it all, he has given me things to look back on that I can trust him in new situations. Through all my growth at Miller and all the lessons I have learned, a majority of the time it has come through pain or a trial of some kind. I have learned as much from those things as I have from the good things like classes when the homework that I tried to do, even though it's probably 2 in the morning when I'm doing it. So to close, I would like to read you a passage from Romans 5 that really captures what I have learned at Miller. Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So while Miller has always had like been a lot of fun for me, it's also been very difficult. But through those times in our lives where we face difficulty, that is when God can teach us even more than, than when things are going really good in our lives. So that's what I've learned at Miller. Well, thank you, Riley. And now we're going to move on to Ephesians. So tonight, uh, like I've said every week, we're just continuing to work our way through Ephesians and look at that word walk. And you remember last week, we looked at that concept where you were to put something off and then you were to put something on. Do you remember what that was about? What was it like? It was like taking off what? Anyone remember? Yeah, taking off your, like changing out of your clothes and putting on different clothes, right? And so there's one re more really neat one of those uh, just at the end of chapter four. And it's one of those passages, I don't know about you, but I've read it lots of times, and it's quite intimidating. Because here's what it says. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. So therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And I don't know of you, but every time I come across that in my Bible reading, I'm always pretty intimidated that we are to uh, follow God's example and be an imitator of God. Um, but it's really neat uh, just whenever you kind of look at the verses before it and just kind of put it into its context and just even see how we can actually do that. So let me read just a couple of verses. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. So there's again that image, put it away. So put those things off. So um, you've got bitterness, which speaks of like a sour spirit. You've got wrath, which is like, a brewing hostility, anger, which is the outburst of that hostility, clamor is shouting and screaming at one another, slander speaking evil of one another, and malice wishing for ill will on someone or wishing ill on somebody. And here's what Paul wants them to understand. Here's what's really important. It's tied in with that little phrase as beloved children because what Paul wants the Ephesians to grasp and the amazing truth that you see in Ephesians is just this reality that 
like we, locked, like we talked about in other weeks, what they once were and what they are now, where before they were outside of Christ, before they were enemies of God, yet now they are in Christ. And they have that new identity and that new nature. And that to be, uh, as, to be referred to as beloved children is just that reminder that we have that new image and that new nature in us. And so what he's saying to them is, you should have the family trait that's in you. That when it says be imitators of God as beloved children, it's really that picture of this kind of like a family resemblance or like a family business if you wanted to use that phrase. And so he said to these people, he said, hey, whenever somebody would look at your life, they shouldn't see these old things, the bitterness and the wrath and slander and uh, those types of things because they're not part of our family. They're not part of who we are. And so you need to put off those things. And then what, what should they put on then in its place? He said, you're to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgive you. And so what he said is the priority, or if you were to look at their walk or their life, then you should see that tender-heartedness, a compassion that should exist amongst this, this group towards themselves and then towards outsiders as well. They're to be marked by forgiving one another. And uh, it's really that acting in grace towards one another. He wants them to be uh, that priority of grace in all their actions. So whenever they're forgiving one another, it's just that reminder that we do need to forgive one another, that we are going to offend each other and hurt each other at times. But in the midst of that, we're going to be acting out in grace towards one another. And so, yeah, we're to be forgiving one another. And then, of course, there's that example again, as God and Christ forgive you. That's the example that we're to follow. And then it comes to, therefore, be imitators of God. And it's just what we were doing with Amanda, right? Where Amanda was teaching us the action and teaching us the verse. And then we were following that example. And so, again, there's just meant to be that culture within the church there where they are imitating God. They're becoming more and more like Him. They're becoming more, they're growing in their knowledge of Him. Well, again, what does that mean exactly? I think he sort of clarifies it and develops it in the next phrase where he says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and give himself up for us. And so it's that life that is sort of defined by love. It's defined by love and it's Christ's love in us. And you see, even he defines it a little bit further because he defines it by Christ as the example, giving himself up for us. And so there's just that, he's alluding to the point that love, the love that he's talking about is a self-sacrificing, a giving love. And so he wants them to be defined by those things. It sounds like a neat community to be part of. And that's the same calling that's on this community, on the com community of Emmanuel, that we'd be those who would have put off those other things, the slander and the bitterness and those other things that we were describing and then at the same time to have put on or to be intentional and to be intentional about being kind to one another, to be intentional about forgiving one another, to be intentional about walking in love with one another. And so that's really the, the, just the lesson for tonight of how we are to walk. We're to walk in love and that's to be the defining characteristic of the group here and of, of church in general, wherever we're talking about. So that's just our little walk phrase for this evening. And uh, yeah, we'll call up Tyler now, just for the testimony. Olivia. Come on up, Olivia. Here she comes, yeah, give her a hand as she comes. <laughs> Olivia is one of our high school students. She goes to Fulton, she loves Jesus, and that's all I'm gonna say about her and she's gonna say the rest. That uh, I'm just gonna ask you three questions, kind of similar to what we were doing in the past. Uh, so just briefly, Olivia, just tell us a little bit about your growing up. Um, so I grew up in the Lower Mainland in Langley. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a Christian family in a Christian home, and I had lots of support from my parents, uh, my mom and dad and my brother, and yeah, so elementary school was pretty good for me. Um, but grade three and four were really difficult years for me as both of my grandmas passed away in those two years and it kind of led me into this really dark place of a lot of anxiety and fear that took over my life. And 
um, so that kind of just took over my life for a long period of time because I, know, I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't really have that relationship with him yet. So I didn't know that I could really go to him and talk to him about those things. So it took over my life in a really big way for a long time. And in grade six, um, my other grandpa passed away. So then it kind of just got worse again. Um, grade seven rolled around and every summer, me and my parents, we would visit up here in Vernon on vacation. And we'd always kind of joke about, oh, maybe we'll move up to Vernon one day. And we'd look at houses for fun and stuff. And that summer, we ended up putting an offer on a house up here. And it was a really, really quick move and a fast transition and kind of crazy that it even all happened so smoothly. And throughout that period of time, as I look back, I would have thought that I would have been full of all this fear and like doubt and not knowing what was going on. And yet I just had this like vast amount of like purpose and peace through all of it. And I just like knew that I was supposed to be moving here. And so grade eight came around and I um, had a pretty good start to that, but my relationship with the Lord still wasn't really there. And so I found a lot of my identity in what other people thought about me. And um, so that ended up in me questioning my worth and not really knowing who I was as a person and wanting validation from other people all the time, which was not a great situation to be in either as entering high school. And I ended up becoming friends with some really wonderful Christian people at Fulton who brought me to youth group. And then that ended up in us being a part of Emmanuel. And grade nine rolled around the fall of that year. And that was when the Mexico missions trip was announced for that time. And at first I was quite kind of hesitant about it and I wasn't sure if it was something I was supposed to do. But um, the Lord really kind of put it on my heart. And by March, I was on a plane to Mexico which was a really huge step for me as I still had kind of struggled with anxiety up in that point in my life. And so I kind of put all my trust into that and I was like, okay, God, if this is something you want me to do, then just push me to go and do it. And throughout that entire time in Mexico, I just felt like this overwhelming amount of love and joy and I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. So I think that was kind of, <laughs> I think that was kind of when um, my real relationship with the Lord had kind of started. That's awesome. Yeah, the formative times, a few of them. Uh, it's so good. So then just lastly, uh, for the last couple minutes, what has God been doing in your life sort of the last year or the last little bit or showing you or bringing you through? Um, definitely. So obviously COVID was a big thing to kind of have to go through, um, especially as I'm still in high school. So that's been kind of interesting. Um, as much as COVID was kind of hard, I think that for me, it was really necessary to have a little bit of a period of time with a break. And so for me, I had no more reasons to kind of be like, hey, God, I'm too busy to read my Bible today, or I'm too busy to be praying. And so I was just spending every day in the word. And it just really grew my relationship with him. Um, in the past year, I've really just been learning to trust in his purpose for my life and his plan for my life and knowing that I feel like I'm kind of in this time of waiting right now, kind of waiting to graduate, waiting for a lot of things to start, but um, to just have patience through those things and to know that God's gonna bring his purpose for my life to pass. So I don't need to really worry about it, but just to kind of let it go to him and continue to trust in him throughout that. Awesome, surprise question. Uh, sorry, not sorry. What are you doing after high school or do you know? Perfect. Um, as of right now, I'm hoping to get my TEFL certificate, which is teaching English as a foreign language, and hopefully going and teaching abroad for a while, and hopefully tying in missions work with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Give her a hand. Thank you, Livia. Before Tyler goes, I'm just going to just grab the bin, actually. I'll keep my clipboard. Yeah, yeah, no, it's confusing. It is trivia time, and uh, I'm just gonna explain, there's a new rule this week, it's called the Schmirler rule. If you've had so much snack that your pants can't stay attached, you, you don't get to come, basically. So you lose, so don't do that. Can you pick out three names from that for me, please, Tyler? There's one. We had a lot of people that were fighting for this tonight, for this opportunity. <laughs> All right, so we have Josh Kuros, Alberto, and Andrea Mitchell, who was really, I'm, where is Andrea? She was really excited. That's great. 
So tonight's a little special. Before, as they're coming up, uh, our at-home question. If you're at home, uh, you can have a chance to win a prize. If you can answer the question, text it to that number, 778-932-2339, or leave a voice message. What were the names of Job's three friends who came initially to visit him? So you can text that to me now. Uh, fabulous prizes for that. And tonight, uh, special for you guys tonight, we have a question with three answers. So the good news is if you get an answer, you get a chance to spin a wheel. Does that make sense? Uh, first person that, sorry? Yep. It should be really fair, but we'll take the first person who, who gets to, to get the, an answer, rings the bell first. Uh, Josh, can you move your bell back? That's a little bit of a cheat. There we go. Yeah, and Andrea, you're a little older, as your daughter was saying, so you can put your bell wherever you want. <laughs> All right. So if you have an answer, we'll ring the bells, we'll establish order, and then we'll answer a question. And if you get the answer correct, you'll get to spin. So when Rebecca suggested to Jacob that they trick Isaac into thinking that he was Esau, what three things did they do together to fool Isaac? So I think it was that uh, Josh. Andrea, and then Alberto. So Josh. OK. Judges, do we take that? Yeah. No. Pastor Don? <laughs> yeah? Yeah? We'll take. Are you happy with that? Yeah? yeah? There was a stew made. And it was Ma that made the stew, of course. So come on over and have a spin. You guys can think while you, he's spinning. That's the good news. All right, so you can go out and grab your blue box. And just don't open it yet. We'll do them all at once. OK, uh, Andrea, you were second. Do you have another answer to that? <laughs> That's right. And out of curiosity, what kind of skins? <laughs> it, it was goats, yes. All right. I don't know why I did that. That's, now you're never going to play again, are you? But go ahead and spin the wheel. So, what do you guys think? Should we give her another chance? Yes. Okay, give it. Oh. <laughs> okay, you can grab that box. Just watch out for the candy on top of the box. And Alberto, do you have a third answer? Uh, the clothes. The clothes. Yes. Awesome. So come on over. You see how easy this is? Those of you who are hesitant, this is not hard. Oh, is that what you've got? That's green. That's green. It's oh, that's green. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, that's green. You can grab the green box. There is a green. Green and yellow look a lot alike. So go ahead, guys. Open your prizes here, and you can reveal to the audience what you have so wonderfully won here. We have some sunny bread. <laughs> T-shirts. And a soccer ball for Andrea. That's great. It's and Mentos, all right. That's, that's a couple of weeks of worth of sermon Mentos there. Thank you for playing there. All right, so on our travels to Israel tonight, we are going to a beautiful spot. But before we get to the beautiful spot, we need to show you an aerial view here of the place we're going. You are looking at, anyone know what that is? Dead Sea, which isn't in many ways such a beautiful spot, right? That's the interesting kind of part of what we're going to talk about tonight. But back in Genesis chapter 13, if you read the story going on there, you will meet Abraham and Lot. And they have just left Egypt, and they have come back to the promised land, and uh, they discovered that they have too many livestock to stay together. They're going to have to split up. And so Abraham says to Lot, you can choose first. You choose the area you want. And Lot makes the choice to stay in the Jordan Valley, essentially the area right around the Dead Sea. And the reason he does is because it is beautiful. He says it is like the garden. He actually says it's like, the, it's like Egypt. It is so fertile and beautiful. And so this area at that point was beautiful. And then if you remember what happens, the Lord destroys two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and this area is devastated. And so now today if you go and visit, of course many people want to go because they want to swim in the Dead Sea because it's filled with salt and you can't drink it and it gets in your eyes. And if you have any cuts at all on your body and you get into that body of water, 
it is the most horrific experience of your life. But all that aside, there is one other place that actually, if you ever get there, is far better to swim in. It's called En Gedi. And that's where we're going to go tonight. And so we're going to jump to the next picture here. And uh, En Gedi is a beautiful, we'll call it an oasis, tucked away in the hills around the Dead Sea. So that's kind of what the hills around the Dead Sea look like. And then if we go to another picture, I think we'll see one more picture of kind of the area around the Dead Sea. You see how this bleak and desert-like, there is no water. What water is there is filled with so many salt, so much salt and chemicals that you can't drink it, it can't sustain life. But tucked away in those mountains is one of the most beautiful places you will ever visit, a place called En Gedi. Shows up a number of places in scripture. Uh, probably the most famous is in the story of David. It's, uh, the, way, the word in Gedi means spring of the wild goats. And so uh, on this, this side of the Dead Sea, there's only two sort of potable sources of water, two springs. And so basically anyone going through this area for hundreds of miles around would have to go here to get water. So a couple of the places it shows up in Scripture are when armies are coming to invade Israel, like in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The armies that are coming, they gather at this place because they would have needed water. You're out in the middle of the desert, and there's no source of water. So they would come to En Gedi. Let's jump to another picture here. And uh, when you go there and visit, there's a beautiful trail, and you walk through this really rugged sort of sort of valley, and there's caves on both sides, but there in the narrow part of the trail is this water that comes trickling down that makes it just lush and beautiful. So if you're looking down from the top, you can see kind of the vegetation coming down through this trail. And then En Gedi itself is actually a series of seven waterfalls. So I think we've got uh, pictures of a few of them. There tucked up in the mountains are these most beautiful waterfalls, and today they have like signs over them saying, do not swim. But it's hard to say if you can read the signs, and so you might want to go for a dip when you're there. All right, uh, those are the kind of uh, waterfalls that they are. Now, the reason this story shows up in Scripture is because of one of the most famous people to hide out here, a man by the name of David. And if you read in 1 Samuel 23 and 24, this is where David comes when he's hiding from Saul. And so a number of the stories around that time take place right here. We're not exactly sure of the exact spots, but in this sort of area where David is hiding out in caves. And so if you remember one of the most famous stories, Saul has come. He's told that David is hiding in a Gedi. And so he comes with his soldiers and he's hunting David down. And David's hiding in a cave. And Saul decides to go and relieve himself, not knowing that David's hiding in that exact cave. And David has the chance to kill him, but he doesn't. And uh, it's a, a fairly amazing series of stories, which led then to a series of very amazing things that David wrote. And so if you read in the Psalms, you'll read at least two places where David writes Psalms from here. And I'll read you one of them. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy. I pour out my complaint. I tell my trouble before him. My spirit faints within me. You know the way in the path where I walk. They have hidden a trap. You remember that? The path, when you see it going up through it, I just kind of picture it's like David's kind of almost imagining like the way before him is like that path up through this little valley. And he says, they've, they put a trap there and I look to the right and see and there's none who takes notice of me. There is no refuge remaining. And I'm not gonna finish that Psalm. Instead, I'm gonna jump to another one. Same place where he would have written in Psalm 59. Uh, sorry, no, Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful. And you, my soul, takes refuge. Remember what he said in the Psalm 142? There's no refuge left. And then in Psalm 57, my soul takes refuge in you. In the shadow of your wings, I take refuge. Till the storms of destruction pass, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and he will save me. The other thing I want you to think about too as we look at these pictures here is... Um, a number of other psalms where David talks about the, the righteous being like a tree planted by springs of water. Springs, water, trees. This is what you need to picture. Don't picture, I know when I read those, I always picture like a lush BC river, like, you know, the Enderby, Enderby Valley going up to Mabel Lake. It's like, oh, beautiful. Everything's growing and green. That's not what David's picturing when he says, you want to know what a righteous person's like? It's like in the middle of that bleak, impossible area these trees grow because there's a spring. Last but not least, Ezekiel 47 brings up this place. And in Ezekiel 47, we have this vision of things to come, that one day God is going to bring his creation to this incredible conclusion. And Ezekiel says, in that day, 
People are gonna fish at the Dead Sea. Remember that first picture where there's this, this Dead Sea? They call it the Dead Sea for a reason. Nothing lives in it. But, but Ezekiel says, oh, one day God's gonna renew his creation. And people at En Gedi are gonna fish in that lake and catch fish. And so that's a pretty interesting, amazing kind of image if you can kind of picture the amazing things God's gonna do to renew his creation. And I hope you enjoyed your visit to En Gedi tonight. All right, so now we get a topic that's so easy to cover in five minutes, and we're going to go over the problem of suffering and evil, and there's no way we can do it justice in the time frame that we had. The reason why we want to cover this, it is one of the most cited reasons why people leave the faith. It's also one of the most cited reasons how people grow the faith or come to the faith. So it's good to have an understanding of what it is, and we're looking at two main things. The intellectual or the logical argument, is suffering and evil logically incompatible with God being in the world? And then there's the emotional side, which we're not going to figure on very much. And if you are currently suffering, what we're going to go through tonight is not meant to lessen or minimize anything you're going through. Because the hard truth is, we don't know specifically why we go through any of the things in our life. It is impossible to be proven, and we don't know after the end if we're even going to care when we get to them. Right? But that's the main thing. Right? And I'm not going to give a Christian checklist of do these five things to make sure you never suffer, or do these five things to get out of suffering. Right? This is just going to be pure. Right? And there's two key objections, and this has come, been around a while. So if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he can't stop it, then he may be good, but he's not all-powerful. And if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he could stop it and chooses not to, then he might be all-powerful, but he's not good. Either way, the God of the Bible doesn't exist according to this argument. Sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? Anybody notice an attribute of God that's missing out of those two sayings? All-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing. If God being all-knowing, that can explain these things, right? If God's all-knowing, then it's reasonable to believe that God would have a morally sufficient reason for permitting suffering and evil. Here's the one thing that's true. Truth does not always feel true. If the doctor came up to you and said, you know what, if you eat another white chocolate macadamia nut cookie, you're going to die. Your health cannot take it. You cannot eat this. You are going to die. And then somebody takes white chocolate macadamia nut cookies just out of the oven, and they're nice, crispy, and chewy. And when you bend it, you know how the chocolate stretches? In that moment, the truth of that chocolate chip cookie tasting good is much stronger than the truth if you eat it, you're going to die. And it's the same thing whenever we suffer. The truth of God does not always feel real, because of what we're going through. It doesn't change the truth of God, but whether we feel it's real or not in that moment because of what we're going through, it can feel less real. Does that make sense? Right? And there's three other considerations. So is all suffering bad? Think of parenting. Well, I guess it depends if you like your kids or not. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you let your kids suffer. If you tell them no, right, they may kick and scream and hate you in that moment, but you know it's for their best. Or working out, your muscles are aching and sore. There's suffering that is good for you. Thankfully, I don't suffer from that very often. <laughs> Man needs difficulties. They are necessary for health. That's a statement by the philosopher Carl Jung. Right? The other thing is, with those two statements, is because I cannot think of a good reason for suffering, therefore there isn't one. And if you're a student... Just try going into your next exam and write, I cannot think of a good answer for this question. Therefore, there isn't one. And hand that in and see how it works out. <laughs> right? The other thing is we assume, because we can't think of it or there shouldn't be this evil and suffering, that we're actually morally superior to God. That God's morals are lesser than what we have. So where do our morals come from? So if they come from society... So who thinks the Taliban have the same moral structure as we have? What about our own society? Has our moral structure changed in our society in the last hundred years? 
If it's adjusted, then we don't have a consistent moral standard. The only way that we can have a consistent moral standard is something outside of ourselves, outside of humanity, outside of our society. That is the only way you can have a consistent moral standard. Otherwise, you're on a moving target. You can never have that standard. Right? Richard Dawkins says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Which is a moral judgment. Where do you get his moral from? How can something be pitiless? Right? And if we get our morals from nature, nature is kill or be killed, survival of the fittest. If nature is all there is, what makes violence wrong? So what about the other thing is the most, the biggest purpose in life is to bring the most happiness to the greatest amount of people. So if 51% thinks that killing the other 49% is okay, then we should do that, right? That would be morally acceptable. Bring the most happiness. We can eliminate suffering now by eliminating all life on the planet. We have the means to do it. Would that be morally acceptable? Of course, we eliminate all joy, all love, all compassion at the same time. All worldviews have a problem with, with evil and suffering. Which one brings hope? Right? Consider all, that all evil and suffering in the world could be what freely brings the maximum number of people into, this king, into his kingdom to find salvation and eternal life. You can find that in Romans 8. If not, you've got to find another alternative reality that you can prove that says that that's not true, and this one would be with less suffering. Right? We also have to agree that... Christianity includes an eternity. Is there any proof that anything that we suffer through in this life actually affects what we're going to feel like in eternity? Will it have a negative effect there? And I believe there's none. Right? For most of this, this is an emotional problem. We don't like to think of God as someone who would allow suffering. But then you think of it, Jesus went on the cross, took all the pain, all the sins, including separation, a cosmic separation, from the Father. Not only did he not stand behind and say, okay, you guys go suffer, I'll just watch. He came down and shared in that suffering to provide a way. Right? If you look at the, the summary, if the Lord of the Rings, right, Don? What would the Lord of the Rings be if they never went through any trials and tribulations? Would anybody ever read the book? You know, can we have courage without vulnerability? Can we have compassion without pain? And the book Tuesdays with Maury, Maury was a guy that was suffering with ALS. There's two quotes that I have. It's hard to explain, Mitch. Now that I'm suffering, I feel closer to people who suffer than I ever did before. And I'm dying. Why do you think it's so important for me to hear other people's problems? Don't I have enough pain and suffering of my own? Of course I do. But giving to other people is what makes me feel alive. Jesus arguably suffered more than we can imagine. And what did he challenge us to do? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit. Right? We may not know why we suffer, but what did Jesus compel us to do? Go out and minimize suffering wherever and whenever you can. Thanks, Mike. Sorry, my leg fell asleep there. Just about went down. Would have been for your entertainment, though. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we're done for tonight, just about. Next week's our last week. It has been a joy. It's been a pleasure uh, hearing from lots of different people and, and, and different stories and different challenges, and laughing together has been really fun. And so today's challenge, again, with the theme of our, our solas, today is Christ alone. And uh, just very simply... Uh, I want you again to look at scripture. One of the first things uh, that we were taught in Bible school, I think, uh, the first week that is that through the entirety of scripture, from Genesis to this one, did it die? Yeah, I think your battery is probably dead. You're just you turn inside, boy. From the, um, <laughs> it's all good. You turn inside, boy. That's good. Thank you. Um, yeah, from Genesis to Revelation. You need to, to read the entire scripture with the, this messianic thread. Christ is in all of it. You see it in Genesis 1. 
right? And so with that, you can read through it and go, where is Jesus in this? And we heard some quotes even from like Isaiah tonight about what is going to happen, what's going to take place on the cross through Christ. And so my challenge for you tonight is to, it's kind of three, three things. You can choose one or all of them. You can either go through all the Bible, you can go through the Gospels, or you can just go through John. Uh, and I'm going to read from John in a moment. But what I want you to do, if you're, maybe you're in the habit of journaling, I know I'm not necessarily in the habit of it, but I know when I do that, that practice, it is tremendously beneficial to just write your thoughts down, to write what you see in Scripture down. And so, very simple challenge. Go through the Gospels, or go through even just one of them specifically, and look for the person of Jesus. Look for uh, uh, the divine Jesus. Right? I, want you to, I want you to write down things. Hey, I noticed this about Christ. That is phenomenal. Or, or what about how he interacts with this person? And I was just reading earlier, just his interaction with, with Nicodemus, or his interaction with the woman at the well. The all-knowing God... Now, as men, interacting with the very people that he created. And just unpack that and write down the things that you see. And so I want to just read. Uh, so it's literally in the, in the sense of homework. It is homework. You're just looking at something and writing it down. It's very simple. But I do believe it's going to be a great practice for you this week. And so I just want to read from John 1. right? And this is talking about Christ. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that had been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And then we jump down to verse 14, and this is the beauty uh, of the, the gospel message, is that God comes to us. The word became flesh, and did what? Dwelt among us. Dwelt among his people. We observe his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And, and ultimately, Jesus came to die for our sins, and ultimately, he didn't stay dead. He is the risen Lord, and we get to celebrate him. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we all came here this morning. That's why throughout this week, you and your families are, are going to serve him in the various ways that you do. And that's why hopefully you're going to take the challenge. I know no, we're not all taking it, but hopefully we take the challenge this week and just go through a gospel, go through the entire Bible. Obviously, don't read the entire Bible in, in one week. If you do, please tell me. I'd be very impressed. Uh, but look for, for Christ in it because he is the main point of it all, isn't he? So that's it tonight. Next week, uh, great uh, glory will be. Is that correct? Awesome. I'm going to pray. And uh, we're going to send you on your way. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your tremendous grace and mercy and love in our lives. Thank you that uh, you sent your son to dwell among us. Thank you for the things that Jesus did while he was on this earth. Thank you, Jesus, for interacting with your people. Thank you for showing us how to love one another and how to live for you, God, how to love you. And so we just praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care and God bless.